Hello Calculus Kids, this is Mr. Bean, and in today's lesson we're going to do something that's actually a little bit easier than the stuff we've done, so that'll be a nice break, because I know you've been busting your brain cells trying to figure out what we're doing. Uh, so in this lesson, let's get review real quick. We learned before that this integral symbol, this definite integral, represents the area under the curve on a specific interval, the interval from A to B. So you have a lower limit down here, an upper limit up there, and that gives you on that interval from A to B, it tells you the area under the curve, what it is. And that little weird symbol here, that integral symbol, it represents like an S, like the sum of all the numbers. Okay, so what if we started at A, but then we don't have our upper limit B? We don't know where we're stopping. Okay, so what that would do is it would give us this interval from A to X. We're going to say it's going to stop at an unknown variable X. If that were to happen, then you'd have this expression here, A to x of f of, and then you'd have to have a different variable. You can't say x here because you're already using x here. So our, our new function that we, we're coming up with is this weird function, I'm gonna call it capital F, and it's gonna go from a to an unknown, and then we'll do little f of t. This t doesn't matter, it could be any variable we want, it just can't be the x because this input x is going to tell us when to stop to figure out the area under the curve of this little f. Okay, so now let's go to the next part. Now we will take this function, I'm gonna say from zero to x of little f. So over here on the graph, we can label this one little f of t. That's what this is. And we are going from zero to five. So let's do an accumulation of what is happening here of the area under the curve. So if we say x is zero, what we're really saying is, what is from zero to x? So in this case, it's zero of little f of t. What does that equal? Well, that would equal, if you go from zero to zero, the area from zero to zero is nothing. So that's easy, zero. And now if we do the next one, what that's saying is if we go from zero to one of F, what is that? That's going from zero to one. So here we have this area here underneath that. So that's one square, two squares, two and a half squares. So this will be 2.5. And now we're gonna go from zero to two of the function f. So now I'm gonna go over one more and I get one block here, half a block there. So I'm adding 1.5 to the previous one. So I'm adding 1.5 to this. So that gets me up to four. So you can see what we're doing is we are accumulating as we go. Remember how we talked about accumulation? Uh, we Accumulation of change. That's what's happening. It's like we're accumulating this area as we add up. So if we go to three now, we're adding one more block, so now we're at five. And then if we go to four, we're adding half a block, so we're now at 5.5. And then this last area here, it's now underneath the x-axis, so I'm going to subtract that, and that brings us back to five. Okay, so here, if and then if I wanted to graph it, you could. Uh, let's see how orange shows up. So it would be zero, zero, I'd put a dot here. Uh, one and 2.5, one and 2.5 would be there. Two and four would be here. Three and five. Three and five's up here. Four and 5.5's off my grid a little bit, and then that would come back here. Okay, so that would be like a general idea of a shape of what this capital F, whoops, that capital F is doing. That's this little orange graph. So this is called an accumulation function. We accumulate as we go, uh, we might be getting bigger, we might be getting smaller, depending on the graph is above or below the x-axis, but that's what it is. When you have an integral that represents a function, it's called an accumulation function. Now that leads us to the next important part of our lesson, which is the fundamental theorem of calculus. Now I wanna put in parentheses, part two. And the reason I'm saying part two is because most textbooks and probably a lot of the calculus teachers I've talked to actually teach this second. Uh, the reason I'm teaching it first is only because College Board recommended that we do it first. But most of your textbooks that I have seen and I've checked with a lot of other things, math, uh, uh, calculus stuff, is that they teach this one second. It's okay if we learn it first, doesn't matter. I'm just referring to it as part two because you might see it in a lot of other places as part two. So later on in unit six, we'll do the part one of the fundamental theorem of calculus and they are tied together. So what this is, is when you take the derivative of an integral, and you're going from A to an unknown variable. When you take the derivative of that, what you get, this is crazy, is little f of x. Okay, so if you have an integral 
and you take its derivative, you get what's inside here. In other words, derivatives and integrals cancel each other out. They're inverses of each other. They're inverses just in this way that multiplication and division are inverses of each other. Like if you were solving an equation and you were multiplying, you'd have to divide to cancel it. That's what derivatives and integrals do. They cancel each other. So derivative, integral, you get what was inside here. It's called the integrand. That's what this is. But so you that just becomes this with the x plugged in. So let's go back to the graph we were just looking at. This capital F, this thing and how it relates to little f. So if we have little f and we took the integral of it, what you get is the antiderivative of little f. So the integral of something is the antiderivative. So the derivative of the integral gives you the little f, which means if you're doing the integral of this, you'd get the capital F, and that capital F is the antiderivative. Okay, whoa, that was confusing, but trust me, by the time we get done with unit six, you are gonna crush this stuff. This really isn't that bad. So today's focus is gonna be really simple. We're just gonna practice taking the derivative of something that has an upper bound that it is a variable, and that's all we gotta worry about. Now, before we do the variations, let's just practice what we did with this one. Let's just plug in this x for a really simple practice one. So notice on this first example, we are going to take the derivative of this, so f prime of x is going to equal, now the bottom one, this two, it doesn't matter. It just had to be a constant. If you look back up here, it, the a is a constant and that's all it says. It doesn't say what number it is, just that it's a number. And as long as that happens, then all you do, the derivative of an integral cancels and that upper bound just gets plugged in. So it's just three x squared plus four x and that's it, we're done. That simple, take the x, plug it in. Okay, so now let's do ones that are a little bit harder, which is the rest of these, but they're not that much harder. So this first one, sometimes it's not just an x, but it might be a whole expression up here. So I call, I'm gonna call it g of x. If you have that, you plug in the g of x still. So you take this g of x, plug it into there where that t was, but then you have to apply the chain rule. Remember chain rule, the onion rule makes you cry. The, ch the chain rule is going to make us multiply by the derivative of what we just plugged in. So let's do a couple examples just like that. So this one, we're going to take the derivative and there's not a lot of room here. The derivative of x is going to equal the derivative of f prime of x, big F of x is going to equal, take this x cubed, plug it in. So it's going to be sine of x cubed. And then you times that by the derivative of what you just plugged in, which is three x squared. And then if we wanted, we could put that three x squared in front and make it sine of x cubed. Okay, so there is our derivative of the big function f of x. Okay, this is the same idea. So there's there's a constant on bottom, something with variables on top. We are going to plug it in. So we get f prime of x is equal to, plug it into the t, so it's just 4x, and then you times that by the derivative of what you plugged in. So that's the chain rule part, so times by four. And then we could change that to make the four uh, like a coefficient. So it's four times h of four x. We did, in this case, we didn't need to know what h of t was. We just knew that it was a t and then that gets plugged into the function there. Okay, so now let's go back and look at the other variation that we haven't done yet, which is when you have variables both on top and on bottom. So your upper limit and your bottom limit have variables in it. Some, thing, some expression involving x. So what happens in that case? This is what you get, this long, crazy thing. Well, look at this. If we break it down, it's not that bad because this goes in first. All you're doing is you take the upper bound, you plug it into the function t, where f of t, plug it in and then do the chain rule times it by g prime. Then you subtract the one that's on bottom. So we're going to subtract, then the h gets plugged in. So here's the h of x plugged into the f and you times it by the chain rule, multiply by the derivative of what you just plugged in. Okay, so it's almost like the one on top, except now you have to subtract the lower limit that gets plugged in. Okay, let's apply that, get that written down and then let's practice it with this. So I'm going to, I'm not gonna write F prime just because I don't, may not have enough room here. So just know we're finding F prime. That's what we're doing on this next step. So take this X and plug it in. So we get five, plug in the X and then you take the derivative of what you just plugged in. But in that case, that case the derivative of X is just one. And then you subtract and now we take this again, this function 5t, and you plug in the lower limit, which is negative x, times it by the derivative of the lower limit, which is negative 1. 
and now we simplify this becomes 5x a minus and a minus is positive but then another minus and so negative 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 that's going to give you a negative 5x and then that simplifies down to zero okay let's try this one uh, this last one is going to be the 3x gets plugged in so we're going to have 3x being squared minus and then a 3x now this now that we've plugged in the 3x you have to multiply this whole thing so i'm going to put some brackets around it multiply the whole thing by the derivative of what we just plugged in which is three okay done with the upper limit now we take the lower limit and we subtract the 2x being plugged in so subtract i'm going to do brackets again subtract 2x squared minus 2x close my bracket and now multiply by the lower limits derivative we just plugged in the 2x now you have to multiply by its derivative which is 2 and then from here it's just algebra simplification get this expression simplified so i'm going to speed up my recording here 9x squared minus 3x times 3 minus 4x squared minus 2x times 2 and we get 27x squared minus 9x minus 2 distributes 8x squared plus plus the minus distributes and then the 2 also distributes so plus 4x and then combine my terms and our answer is 18x squared uh, and then negative 9x plus 4x is negative 5x there we go that is the derivative of the integral of this accumulation function okay that's all you're practicing today is this stuff and, uh, and so you're just getting introduced to accumulation functions and then talking a little bit about the fundamental theorem of calculus. We'll talk more about it later on in this unit. Okay, rock that mastery check and I'll see you back in the next lesson.